While Ansett's administrators form their own business on the back of their key client, small retailers who are the victims of Ansett's demise are struggling. Well, to me, it's, it's like we're victims. We're standing there and we're being, we're being shot at. The bullets are being fired by the administrators who are still demanding rent from tenants in Sydney's domestic terminal despite the airline's collapse. Most shops in the Ansett terminal were closed in September when tenants were literally locked out of the building. Owners were briefly allowed back to collect perishable goods and stock but haven't been back since and certainly haven't been trading. They really felt as though they've got a kick in the guts because none of them expected Ansett to, to go under. Many of them have got significant investments, not only in terms of the rent that's owed, but the fit out for some of these stores can vary between $100,000 and $200,000. That fit out is just sitting there, uh, unresolved, they can't get access to it, they can't take it out. Yet the bills keep coming. Mark Wilson, who ran a very successful cafe in the terminal, says the mounting rent bills are ridiculous. It's at a total of uh, about $73,000 at the moment. And not only that, but the administrators have taken thousands of dollars in security bonds from some retailers without telling them. We got this um, uh, statement, bank statement, which, which took $11,500 out of our bank account without our permission. And this $11,500 turned out to be the security bond, which had been held in trust for us in case we didn't pay the rent and they'd seized it um, for an empty shop. After we approached Ansett's administrators to respond for this story, they hastily arranged a series of meetings with individual retailers. But instead of a compromise, the proposal would take even more out of the shop owners. They wanted to empty the airport of all the retailers that were there previously, sell it un unencumbered. The card was, leave the premises, give us, you know, close the lease, finish the lease, and we won't charge you for the next three years. And that was the beginning and end of the negotiation. A similar offer was made to several other retailers and rejected. The chocolate box is now threatening legal action if it doesn't get its bond back. But weeks later, Marion is still waiting for a reply from Ansett's administrators. It's hard to imagine that they're going to negotiate at all. They seem to be set in their ways. They seem to want to get all the money they can, any which way, and don't really have any um, a small retailers of no consequence at all. The Australian Retailers Association says the situation is unprecedented. Well, I think it's pretty appalling. You know, it's a windfall for the administrators. Uh, clearly, uh, the retailer is in a position that uh, he finds it difficult. The cost of defending this, in some cases, through the normal processes here, legally may outweigh the cost of the money that's been taken. We're incurring uh, solicitor's bills at the same time, legal bills, to try and fight the case. And uh, in turn, we've got uh, administrators who don't really have a face. They're quite aggressive and uh, quite uh, bullish and really don't want to know. And all the small retailers we spoke to are getting similar treatment. This is despite all having individual leases, including Mark Wilson, who had his lawyers include a clause in his lease designed to shield Bar Ristretto if Ansett went under. But he says the administrators have refused to listen. I don't believe they've read the lease at all. He too is determined not to let the administrators get away with it. If we can't negotiate something favourable then we will be looking for compensation. We believe we're losing three to three and a half thousand dollars a week and there's a, a loss of half a million dollars in goodwill. So I mean it all adds up and I, 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 we are in the queue with everybody else that believes they're owned, owed money from Ansett. And that's another problem. Even if the retailers fight and win, the chance of recovering their money or getting adequate compensation doesn't look good as they join the long line of unsecured creditors. Mediation through the Retail Leases Unit in New South Wales is an option, but do the administrators want to come to the table? Despite repeated requests for an interview, Ansett's administrators have refused to talk to the Small Business Show. Instead, they issued a statement saying they have a duty to do their best in collecting all Ansett money, money tenants say belongs to them. One can't believe in this day and age that this sort of thing can happen. I mean, it's never, never been done before and one can't believe that it, it can be happening now. And to sit back and just think, well, is it worth the fight? Um, it has to be worth the fight. It can't be right, it can't be ethical that this sort of thing can happen.
It was the power of the motorbike that hooked Alan Simpson. When I was 11 years old, I started riding motorcycles um, as much as my parents didn't really want me to. They were worried about me. But yeah, I started riding motorbikes uh, in off-road riding, dirt riding, and just fell in love with it. And Alan has numerous medals and trophies to show for his efforts. As a top rider, Alan travelled across the country and even overseas. I have a uh, good mate of Wayne Gardner's, who, as most people know, is a, was a world champion motorcycle racer. Uh, Wayne and I both grew up together in Wollongong, uh, both the same age, very similar interests, uh, travelled in the state together as part of a, the Wollongong sort of race team. And in between races, he was busy managing motorcycle shops. But through all this, Alan was in and out of hospital, battling a potentially life-threatening lung disease. Yeah, I was born with a disease called cystic fibrosis, which um, is well known as a, a child's disease. So I've sort of uh, had a battle of that all my life. I found motorcycling was one of the few things I could actually do and do fairly well, where fitness wasn't necessarily a major priority. But the disease was taking its toll, and five years ago, Alan and his wife Wendy moved north from Wollongong to Newcastle so Wendy could go to university to study medicine, an interest sparked by Alan's illness. Alan, too, made a life-changing decision. I was basically out of work. I'd always worked all my life, uh, but I was just getting sicker and sicker, and I found it quite hard to sort of get part-time work, which is all I was capable of at the time. So I started my business in my garage at home in 1997, selling motorcycle spare parts via mail order. Running a business by mail order meant that Alan could work his own hours. I could be travelling down to Sydney to go to hospital or doctor's appointments or whatever, come home at night time, here's all my orders there sitting there ready for me, work sort of later on into the night to get the orders filled and that sort of thing, and uh, yeah, and just repeat the whole thing the next day. And Dallin applied his winning racing tactics to the business of selling hard-to-find classic motorcycle parts. Whenever I've done something, I always tried to do it to my absolute best. You know, So when I was racing, I wanted to be the best I could be. In business, it's the same thing. Every month, I want to be a better month and a record month, and every year a better year, and it's just so many... It's just, you know, it's amazing how similar it is. With his extensive knowledge of motorbikes gathered from years on the road, combined with a shopping cart website, Alan's import-export business took off. You know, we went from doing, I think, uh, $40,000, I think, retail in the first 12 months, you know. Um, we then moved into the shop. We doubled that in the next year, so we had a you know, 100% increase the next year. With a new baby daughter, Hannah, and business booming, Alan seemed to be cruising nicely. But then he hit a bump in the road, doctors giving him just two weeks to live. I had the you know, option of uh, closing the business down and maybe putting it on hold, but you know, we built up such a good client base at that stage. And, uh, and also part of me felt like I was really letting my customers down. Year 2000, um, uh, I had a major operation, I had a double lung transplant. After a 12-hour operation here at Sydney St Vincent's Hospital and many near-death experiences, Alan returned home four months later and went straight back to work, his business having hardly missed a beat. I had a lot of complications, I was pretty crook. Uh, and that was one of the advantages of the way I'd set up the business with a mail order, with the internet. Basically, the business ran by itself, which is why I'd set it up. When you are actually lying in your hospital bed, what was keeping you going? Um, well, we three months before I went to hospital, we actually had a baby daughter, Hannah. Uh, so that was a fairly major motivator. But also, the business uh, really did keep me going as well. And I had visions of where I wanted my business to be. I really enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, yeah, it was amazing. You wouldn't think you'd think about that when you're that crook, but yeah, it was one of the things I needed. Alan now has to take handfuls of pills every day, but it's a small price to pay. As for the business, Alan's breathing new life into it, expanding into the next shop, and is looking at a turnover of half a million dollars this year. I've always lived my life, you know, living it to the max, and I, I've got so many expectations and, you know, so many things I want to do with this business that it's uh, you've got a long way to go yet. Green light, let's do it.
Here we go. Nine o'clock Monday morning, and the Clavelli Community Bank is finally open for business. A piggy bank for little Alex and roses for the staff. A good start and a happy working time here. After two years and a lot of hard work by local small business and the community, this seaside Sydney suburb finally has its own bank. And we now declare the Clavelli Community Bank open. Oh, I'm so excited. This is just like a dream come true to me. Guitar shop owner Christine Gardner spearheaded the campaign for a community bank after the Commonwealth Bank closed its doors on the shopping strip, damaging local small businesses. We've found since the bank left our area three years ago um, that business has dropped dramatically. Um, all business, not, not just ours. Hundreds of letterbox drops and dozens of community meetings later, Christine got the support needed to set up Clavelli's own Bendigo Community Bank. More than 200 locals are shareholders, having raised over $600,000 to go into the bank. Little old lady around the corner, the business is downstairs. Everyone wants to see us here. The Clavelli Community Bank is the 11th in New South Wales and the 71st in Australia. And with the first 30 community banks established already generating profits, the future looks good for Clavelli and the small businesses here. What we're seeing from the sites that have been open now two and three years, they are getting strong acceptance from within their community and they're now making profits on a monthly basis and I think that that'll be the same story for Clavelli. I think they'll do really well. It's going to make so much difference. It'll, it'll bring back the independence to Clavelli. Clavelli will just thrive now. The businesses will do so well. Um, business will pick up for, for all the shops along here and the residents will just benefit greatly from having the services brought back to the area. But the birth of this community bank hasn't been easy, fraught with one delay after another. We were supposed to be one of the first ones open in Sydney, um, but We've had a lot of problems with the building site. It put, put us back about three months. We had problems with leases um, and legal, the legal side of things, so we had to look for another premises at the last minute. That sorted out, Pat Mannix was hired as bank manager along with four other staff, even though the fish and chip shop, now turned community bank, was still boarded up and far from ready to serve. I had no idea. Look, that, that's a real, been a real awakening for us all. Uh, having all worked with the big banks, you expect all the structure around it. Despite this, Pat and the staff got to work for two months in a temporary office above the local physiotherapist. Now, we all did our training together at Bendigo. We came back and here we are in this room. Posters stuck up on the wall with blue tech. I mean, that's great. <laughs> great because he says it's the talk of the community and makes him, as bank manager, more approachable. It adds to that community spirit, the fun side of it. Local hairdresser George Sakalos was the first to open an account. Just to stay local and to support the community. He even installed EFTPOS with the community bank before it officially opened. I was with CBA and um, it was time to make the change since they closed the, the bank in the area. And George is optimistic about the difference it'll make having a bank back on the strip. We'll have a lot, a lot more people in the area sort of coming past, a lot more past trade. Um, which will support all the local businesses in the area, um, all the small businesses. But sadly, the Clavelli Community Bank has come too late for Christine. Her business turnover dropped 30% when the Commonwealth Bank withdrew from the area and never picked up. We just sit, sat down and seriously thought about it and thought, if you can't draw a wage after six years, then it's probably time to, to call it quits. She shut shop in May, unable to make ends meet. It's very sad. Um, we won't be here to appreciate the bank. Rather ironic for the woman who campaigned so hard to get the bank to breathe new life into local businesses. Christine's just amazing. She's just put in so many hours, uh, unpaid work and getting this bank up. She was the first person we had contact with in Clavelle and she's just done an amazing job. And you can bank on it, the community also appreciates it. On opening day, despite the chilly wind and rain, they came out in force to show their support. It gives me great self-confidence and, and satisfaction to know that I did make a difference to Clavelli, even though I won't be around, <laughs> around anymore to appreciate it. But no, it'll be something that I'll be talk, talking to my grandkids about.
Viet Hong Nguyen and Tran Tan Tin have been working this land just outside Adelaide for eight years, growing cucumbers, capsicum and zucchinis for market. In this dry countryside, water is a precious commodity. Despite their leases giving them and three other Vietnamese farmers here unlimited use of the bore on their land, they use the water sparingly, dripping it slowly onto the crops so little is wasted. But in 1998, their world was turned upside down. I don't know what happened. You know, we were from 1994 until 1998. Nothing happened like this before. Their landlord, Avanti Investments, and its then director, Dr. Giuseppe Barbaro, changed their 10 year leases midstream, raising the rent and so increasing their rates and taxes. But most importantly, the amount of water allocated to them was cut. However, the farmers were told their leases were the same, apart from the rent and the terms. We don't understand. He tell it liar to us because the contract has been changed. I uh, was interpreter for them, you know, and I asked the owner like this, do the, uh, the, the uh, new contract look like the first one? The owner says, is this the right one? Only the uh, payment uh, go up. He said like this, so they believe him, you know, because he is the doctor. You know, we believe him. We believe the doctor is a very oppressive people, so we trust him. Could many of the farmers speak or read English? Uh, uh, almost, they, they don't I just uh, talk like, how much, like this only. They don't know to speak English, you know. We cannot read English and we don't know much English. In 1998, Avanti sold more than half of the water allocated to their bore. That left the farmers with about 32,000 kilolitres of water, not nearly enough to grow their crops. As the farmers didn't know their limit had been changed, they continued as usual. The first they found out about it was when they received a bill for more than $67,000 for excess water use. And uh, the owner, the, uh, the doctor, they said, you know, only a week we had to collect the money to pay to him. What did you do? That's why I ring to my accountant, you know, for advice, and she said uh, that uh, we can collect that money. And um, she advised us to see the, the solicitor. Knowing the farmers couldn't afford legal fees, the solicitor went to the ACCC, who took the case to the federal court on the grounds that the landlord had engaged in unconscionable conduct, exploiting the farmers because of their lack of education, little English, and inexperience in commercial dealings. Oh, you know, we were very scared. Were you scared of going to the court in case you lost? No, that's right. But they needn't have been scared. Late last month, the court declared Avanti and the now former director, Dr Barbaro, who didn't appear in court, had in fact engaged in... It also declared Dr Barbaro was knowingly party to the conduct of Avanti. The court ordered the company to pay the excess water charges and all court costs, including those of the ACCC. It also indemnified the farmers against any further excess water charges until their lease expires in 2004, a date the farmers are now eagerly awaiting. Now we work in this land, you know, we're very uh, not, not happy like before. Uh, we wait for until the end contract. We, we, we ship out on the, the greenhouse and last house and find somewhere else, you know, to work again. Farmers' markets are a common sight in Europe and Asia and make up part of their social fabric, allowing shoppers to buy just-picked produce straight from the growers. But they're only just beginning to emerge here. And with new figures showing just how little farmers are getting for their produce when they sell through a middleman and just how much the consumer ends up paying, growers are discovering that selling direct to the public makes good economic sense. Helen Roach is a growers market devotee. I'm looking at about 15 a month, uh, which is a very a big commitment, huge commitment. But I think if you don't have a go, somebody else will, and I'd rather be in there in the forefront of this direct marketing. 
Helen brings apples from her family's orchard in Adelong in southern New South Wales to the Fox Markets in Sydney twice a week. She's just one of hundreds of growers around the country now cashing in on the increasing popularity of farmers' markets. I love the markets, you know, I'm passionate about the markets. I love talking to people, I love getting the feedback from people that, um, that use my product. These kind of markets are a wonderful showcase for the small grower or producer. It cuts out the middleman and lets them go directly to the customer. As a farmer, I'm out here sort of doing the work, I'm not employing anybody and, and uh, I'm enjoying it and talking to the, directly to the customers and uh, yeah, it's, it's good all around. And because there's no middleman, customers often pay less than supermarket prices. The fruit and veggies are fresher too, and growers also can be a little more daring at the markets. It's great for a small farmer like me. I can sort of uh, grow a lot of small, unusual things which I might have trouble selling directly to restaurants or whatever. But here, people are very interested and um, I usually can sell everything I bring. But growers' markets aren't suited to every producer. People who can handle customers well, know their product really well, and who can sell well, it's been wonderful. For people who can't work like that, there are problems. Since we started up two years ago, we've probably lost about 